Guys, look, we call it male pattern baldness. So I have a question for you. Why is there a pattern in male pattern baldness? Up until recently, scientists really had no good explanation for why baldness always follows this clear pattern. But in this video, I'm gonna share the most likely reason why hair loss in men takes place in this very specific pattern. And in doing so, you'll see how it holds the key to truly getting to the root cause of male hair loss. Let's dive in and take a look. So one of the great mysteries of male pattern baldness is this characteristic pattern in which it progresses. Hair loss starts from the frontal area with the first signs usually being a recession of the temple. I remember this stage well, I was only 17. After the temples, the entire frontal hairline starts to recede, giving that enlarged forehead look. The next affected area is typically the crown, though on some occasions, the crown might start thinning even before the front. Drop a comment down below if that's you. Thinning and baldness in the front and crown get progressively more extensive until eventually the two areas merge. This leaves the entire top part of the head without any hair. What's then left is the back and sides of the hair that roughly resembles a horseshoe. And the remaining hair in this horseshoe is for some reason immune to hair loss. Even the most severe cases of male pattern baldness, they will never lose that hair. The mainstream scientific hair loss literature is generally silent as to what causes this specific pattern. If you open a review article or textbook on hair loss, you will see the pattern described in great detail but not much of an explanation as to why it exists. Alongside the detailed descriptions of the pattern, you also find descriptions of the process of hair follicle miniaturization, which is the mechanism underlying male pattern baldness. With each progressive hair cycle, the follicles shrink in size, producing shorter and finer hairs. In the end, the hair is so small that it doesn't even protrude through the scalp. If you ask a mainstream researcher why only hairs on certain parts of the head are subject to this miniaturization, they'll probably answer that it's because these hairs are genetically sensitive to DHT. They might also add that the hairs on the frontal area are programmed to miniaturize first, those on the crown second, and so on. But if you think about it, this is not really an explanation at all, as it just replaces one mystery with another. Adding to that, the existence of this so-called genetic programming itself is simply just pure speculation. Be that as it may, up until recently, hair transplants were often used to support the existence of genetically programmed hair follicle sensitivity to DHT. It was widely believed that hairs from the back and sides of the head never miniaturized even when they were transplanted into the front or crown areas. This allowed hair transplant clinics to advertise their results as being, quote, permanent. And it also supported the idea that those follicles were genetically programmed to never miniaturize. In other words, it didn't matter where on the head they were, their inherent genetic programming prevented them from miniaturization. But setting aside the entire idea of genetic programming, many people suspected that transplanted hairs don't actually last forever, that they too will eventually start to miniaturize and fall out. Mainstream researchers, and in particular the hair transplant industry, were not eager to back up their claims of permanent results with any long-term studies. Well, this all changed in 2020 with the publication of the first long-term follow-up study of hair transplant recipients. It followed 112 patients for four years after they had received a transplant. Their scalp photographs at four years post-transplant were compared with those taken one year post-transplant when the transplanted hairs had had a chance to take and grow out fully. And the results were startling. Compared to their one year follow-up photo, at the end of the study, only 9% of participants retained all their hair. The remaining 91% had lost hairs to varying degrees. So it appears that there is not something special about the hairs from the back and the sides of the head after all. And that there is something about the front and crown of the scalp that leads to follicles there to miniaturize, regardless of whether nature or a surgeon put them there. And there are now countless anecdotes of transplanted hairs starting to miniaturize. In fact, if the patient doesn't stop the DHT with finasteride, those transplanted hairs will start miniaturizing after five years or so. It's a gradual process, 
But without finasteride, that process will inevitably happen to the transplanted hairs. And for example, we have many comments like this one from Red Burley saying that the larger hair grafts last longer, whilst the smaller hair grafts don't last long at all. And this makes total sense considering larger hair grafts come with more scalp tissue surrounding the hair follicle bulb and therefore take a longer time to feel the effects of scalp tension in the new recipient area of the scalp. It simply doesn't make sense that transplanted hairs aren't sensitive to DHT when we see that they do start miniaturizing and smaller grafts start miniaturizing faster. Simply put, transplanted hairs don't last forever unless the patient is taking finasteride. And if that patient took finasteride from the beginning, then they wouldn't even need a hair transplant in the first place. And think about this, the hairs on the back and the sides of the head will continue to grow perfectly healthy for the rest of that man's life. So to date, the only explanation for this pattern that has been offered involves mechanical tension on the scalp. Scalp tension which causes the dermal layer to compress and thus reduce blood flow. There is simply no other explanation as to why transplanted hair would start to miniaturize when it goes into the front of the scalp. The tension is transmitted to the follicles via the underlying tissue called the galea aponeurotica. The galea sits like a helmet on the head which is how it got its name as galea in Latin means helmet. It's the galea that's directly connected to the frontalis muscles on the forehead and the occipitalis muscle on the back of the head. Over time, these muscles exert tension on the glare, which is then transmitted to the overlying skin that contains the hair follicles. It's like the glare is pulling the scalp against the skull and compressing the dermal layer. But at the back and sides of the head, the tension of the scalp against the skull is simply much lower and therefore the hair there never starts balding. As you can see, the overlap between the baldness and the glare is more or less perfect. Only those parts of the scalp overlying the glare are prone to baldness. The areas on the side and back that don't overlay the glare are immune to it. This is all great, but it still doesn't answer that main question. Why do some areas go bald quicker than others? Well, in 2015, a groundbreaking paper modeled the degree of tension the glare experiences from the surrounding muscles. The results showed a remarkable correlation between the degree of tension and the propensity to baldness. The areas of the glare with the highest tension, notably the temples, are the first ones to go bald, followed by those with intermediate tension like the crown and remaining frontal area. And those with the least tension go bald last. You can see it all in this graphic from the study. On the left side is the model of tension with lighter areas indicating higher tension. And on the right is the classic Hamilton Norwood scale. The overlap is pretty mind blowing. Statistically speaking, the chances of this being a coincidence are less than one in 1,000. Unfortunately, these findings have been almost universally ignored by mainstream hair loss researchers. Yet, this is literally the only explanation for the pattern that we see. Add to this that we also know from large-scale, high-quality studies that reducing the chronic scalp tension and thus reducing the compression of the dermal layer reverses this process of balding. It literally regrows hair. Scientists injected the muscles surrounding the scalp with a neuromodulator, which caused the muscles to go flaccid for around six months. As a result, those subjects started regrowing their hair with very impressive results. Simply removing that muscular tension was an effective hair regrowth treatment. But unfortunately, the substance they injected is very expensive, costing thousands of dollars per session, so the treatment hasn't become commercially viable as of yet. And by the way, a question we often get asked is what causes the pattern of hair loss in women? Unlike men, women almost never go completely bald because women don't have high levels of DHT, which plays an important role in the formation of fibrosis. Remember that DHT plus scalp tension leads to fibrosis, which then leads to hair follicle miniaturization. So if you wanna get serious about your hair loss, and treat it at the root cause, it means you're gonna to have to start addressing that chronic underlying tension which compresses the dermal layer where the hair follicle bulb sits. And there is simply no better way to do this than through a state-of-the-art device known as a grow band. Researchers realized this idea about scalp compression leading to fibrosis and therefore hair follicle miniaturization and they created the grow band out of this knowledge that that is the root cause of hair loss. The grow band pushes and squeezes the scalp upwards, 
gradually relieving the tension that has built up over years. This gets to the root cause of hair loss, resulting in semi-permanent changes to the scalp, which make it much more suitable for growing hair and reversing hair loss. And it doesn't have to be either or. To get even better results, you can stack other treatments on top of the grow band. For example, you can add a hair growth stimulant like minoxidil or a DHT blocker like finasteride to get even better and faster results because they simply work through different mechanisms. So when they combine, you get better results. Think about it like a hair follicle is essentially a mini organ that produces keratin. And like all organs, it needs oxygen and nutrients from the blood to function properly. We also know that with scalp massages, it's all about cumulative hours spent massaging and the grow band allows you to spend more time massaging because it's hands-free and fully automated. So you can head over to hairguard.com to check that out. So guys, I wanna hear your thoughts on this video. If you've got a question or a comment, make sure you leave it down below. All good questions, I will make sure that I personally answer. If you've got a friend or a family member with hair loss, make sure you share this video with them, like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.